This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Welcome to yet another episode of Tao Unbound. I'm Ido Aharoni, and it is my pleasure to host Professor Uzi Rabi. Pleasure. Uh, Uzi is the head of the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern and African Studies. And I must say, personally, I'm a big fan. Uh, I watch you on television, and I uh, remember very fondly when you came to uh, give us lectures in the Foreign Service. Every, every year, we would gather all the ambassadors from all over the world and And your lectures were always eye-opening. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to have you here. My pleasure. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we always start by asking uh, personal questions. So I know you, you, you were raised in Ramat Gan, which is, uh, those of us who don't know, a suburb of Tel Aviv, I would say, uh, east of Tel Aviv. And, uh, and your name, Uzi, you know, is a very famous name because of many reasons. Why, why were you named Uzi? Do you know what's the origin? Well, the thing is that uh, <clears throat> I didn't, I wasn't named Uzi from the beginning. I was born, actually, and was named Oscar. Oscar. And this is a different story, actually. My father, who was born in Iraq and was educated in British Iraq, was uh, sort of an Anglophile. And uh, when I was born in Israel, actually, he named me after Oscar Wilde. Uh, he admired him and... Uh, uh, Um, in I'm, I think it was this what my late mother actually was telling me when I was four or five I said that uh, in the kindergarten my name actually has become a sort of a mockery and uh, other other children told me that this is uh, kind of an Arab name Oscar and I demanded my parents actually to change uh, to change it to something which would be sound more Israeli and and These days or those days there was no no name more Israeli than Uzi which had to do with the uh, you know uh, uh, gun machine and all that stuff uh, that um, well the name Uzi. translates yeah into my strength my yeah power, but this, my... that would be kind of a matter of pronunciation when you say my strength you should say Uzi, Uzi. right and you know my teacher actually of you know, geography was, Very, very meticulous in that, and he uh, insisted on just naming me Uzi, but you know, uh, in the neighborhood, among my friends, actually it was Uzi, and it was named after the other thing. and uh, that was those days that was very, very typical and very regular to have people named that way. And right. this is how actually I was renamed from Oscar into Uzi. That's a fascinating was, story. Yeah. And, and uh, the, the choice of Oscar is fascinating too. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, it has to do with my, my research and my study. My parents were born in Iraq. By the way, Ramat Gan those days actually in Israel was uh, named uh, kind of uh, in uh, kind of a, a, a very, very... Uh, I would say sarcastic way or uh, cynically Ramat Baghdad, which means that uh, all those Jews who came from Baghdad or Basra in Iraq, most of them were residing in Ramat Gan. Uh, my, my childhood actually was very, very Israeli because those were the days when Israel was in its, let's say, first decades of existence. But uh, the, the fascinating thing is that uh, uh, I grew up in kind of an environment where my grandma, for example, she didn't know neither English or Hebrew. So I spoke Arabic with her actually day by day. And I grew up in kind of, um, you know, a, a very Israeli, of course, environment, but with a lot of memories from the Arab world. And my uncles, my, my extended family, uh, what they were actually used to do is just, uh, you know, raise memories from times in Baghdad, etc. And that fascinated me because when I went to school, I, I, I took Arabic uh, <clears throat> language as an election or elective course. Thereafter, in the army, actually, I... Uh, Uh, I was in the intelligence unit uh, and thereafter of course Tel Aviv University Middle Eastern Studies. So for you so this was it was a natural transition for you 
to become yes. to become an expert in the Arab world. Exactly, exactly. I, in a way, I was always there. You know, in in my mom actually wanted me actually to become a lawyer or an accountant. This is very very typical of, uh, you know, uh, uh, I would say, uh, Baghdadi Jews, uh, so to speak. But I insisted on that because um, I thought that there is something here that uh, makes me uh, be well connected to my roots. And on the way, actually, I was fascinated by the uh, what's going on in the Middle East, Arab world, uh, and uh, that became actually sort of a profession and expertise. By the way, before we, we, we go into your academic work, um, how do you explain the, the 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 Jews that came from Iraq uh, were, were very different, uh, highly educated, with a strong uh, European orientation, but also with very strong connection to their Arab heritage. It's an ancient Jewish community, obviously, and they did extremely well. When you compare to the to the extent we can generalize, but when you compare the Jews of, that came from Iraq to other groups. They did extremely well. How do you explain that? You know, it starts from Iraq. Those days, Iraq was created in 1921. Those who came, actually, like my father and mother, in 1951 to Israel, actually, they grew up in British Iraq. My father, for example, actually, was educated by a teacher who was brought from London to Baghdad to educate, actually, the... Um, pupils or the students there, that was just kind of an example to what happened there. I have to tell you that, uh, practically speaking, Britain was very, very uh, adamant in its bid to tan Iraq, the newly created Arab state from 1921, to something that would serve as a model in the Middle East. And uh, they insisted on having kind of a very, very high education system and the many, many things that were to resemble or to be similar to what we have in the United Kingdom, which means parties, king, constitution. Basically, I dare say that the British those days were of the opinion that Iraq, the newly created Iraq, should be turned into constitutional monarchy. And basically, you know, my parents and uh, my my extended family, they grew up in an Arab, as you said, environment. And they were very, very fond of this culture. But at the same time, they got more than other Arab Jewry community. They uh, were exposed to something that was the West, as you said. And this is why we have sort of a hybrid here, which came to be very, very distinct in Israeli fabric uh, um, later on. And I think that uh, it's a fascinating story. Now, it, it's only natural for you to write about your, your PhD, and I'm referring to your first uh, big work on tribalism in the Middle East and what happens when tribalism meets nationalism. Tell us about that, that work. I, I think that, yes, uh, you, you, your comment is right to the point. I think that this hybridity that I just talked to you about can be seen all over the place when it comes to the uh, history of the Middle East. You have the patriarchal, tribalistic nature of things, but at the same time, kind of a wide exposure to modernity, to stuff that Europe actually was to bring into the Middle East. And what we have here is kind of a rhythm which was a time very stormy, ups and downs, but people actually were reacting to all these experiences, actually either by the West or by locals. And uh, you know, the whole, uh, my research, and I think that to a large extent, whoever deals with the Middle East should take into, into consideration. You know, people come up more often than not with the question, which is very simplistic, can we have democracy in the Middle East or something like that? They don't take into the account that here we have kind of a culture which is very unique, hasn't been through the process that you have seen in Western Europe, 
And this is why actually when we are dealing with the Middle East, we have to take it uh, with a grain of salt and make sure that we understand that at times we are dealing with this thing and it's opposite. And we are trying actually to just uh, settle or have kind of a logic to be put into this contradiction. Basically, when you look at the uh, history, modern history of the Middle East in the recent century, let's say, many crises actually were the result of this, I would say, uh, meeting point between tradition and modernity. Um, basically, uh, many, many, I would say, negative results were the uh, outcome of that kind of a thing. By the way, uh, you know, uh the, the information revolution and the digital revolution and the dominance of the algorithm actually show us that uh, we're all, as human beings, programmed to be tribal. And it's not just the Middle East, but that's a different story. So so you wrote extensively about countries like Yemen, which you um, wrote a, a book about the anatomy of a failed state. What makes a state um, a failed state? Any state. It has, it has to do with its uh, initial composition. Many states in the Middle East, uh, those who particularly, those who were created by, let's say, Britain and France in the Sykes-Picot Agreement, let's take Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, those states were from the beginning sort of, um, I would say, a bunch of tribes, sects, and minorities being gathered under the title of a nation state or a would-be nation state. So in the beginning, when the British and the French were there, uh, it was, uh, it seemed as if actually this whole process is controllable. But when the British and the French were out after the Second World War and the state became independent, Many sects, minorities, and let us say fractions there, each one of them at time of crisis was uh, very, very uh, independent to think of itself for his basic interest at the expense of the state. So the state was taken captive, basically, by some primordial identities that were there before the state was, were, was created. And thereafter, states like Yemen like Iraq, like Libya, when they came into a deep crisis, they were to be fragmented to the, I would say, uh, back into the pre-state compositions. So in Libya today, you see Kiranaika and Tripolitania fighting each other. This is exactly what was there before Libya was formed. In Yemen, you see South and North and some other tribes fighting each other, something that we are familiar with the Yemenite history. In Iraq, you have the Kurdish autonomy in the north and Sunnah and Shia in between actually fighting each other. Uh, the same goes to Syria, Lebanon, albeit in a different scale, but this was the, the rule. It didn't happen in Egypt. Why? Because Egypt was very monolithic ethnically and religiously speaking. And what about Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia is a different story. Saudi Arabia is a state that, a state that was, was created in 1932 by uh, actually invading into the outskirts or the flanks of the Arabian Peninsula. On the one hand, Mecca and Medina. The other, uh, Al-Ahsa, where actually the oil was to be found, or the, was to be discovered. So we got here kind of a heavy state very, very, uh, um, I would say, rich, uh, starting from the 70s, but still holds the banner of Islam, Mecca and Medina, and a state that, uh, you know, originally uh, was based on Wahhabiyya, which is a very, very puritanic uh, meaning of Islam, Sunni Islam. Uh, this is a state that was Sunni, basically, very, very hostile uh, to the Shia and its... Uh, uh, let us say, uh, Springers. I mean, uh, uh, um, I, I think that uh, what, what, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, this is a monarchy. Uh, didn't wasn't created by 
Western concoction, so to speak, not Sykes Pico or something like that, coming from the Arabian Peninsula. And this is the fascinating thing that I dealt with uh, uh, more often than not how tribes actually are becoming a modern state. And this is a very specific, ongoing process until these days. And every time that Saudi Arabia, even these days, do something which seems very, very peculiar, something that has, hasn't got kind of an, a very well, I mean, not well understood by the listener or the spectator, it has to do with the one-time tribalism. So what we are trying to do in our research center when we are educating our students, when we are talking to the Israeli public, at times even when we talk to policy makers, what we are trying actually to just uh, live behind our analysis and uh, let them internalize it is that you can't deal with the other in the Middle East while using your own standards. So if you would like to understand Saudi Arabia, you have to be familiar with its history, with the way actually they memorize themselves and so on and so forth. And basically, when it comes to the Middle East, yes, we are saying loud and clear that what should be used is kind of, a, you know, a multifocal lens, if I may say so, because Saudi Arabia is Saudi Arabia, Iran is Iran, Egypt is Egypt. On the on 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 one on on the one hand, you should not generalize things. On the other, you should be very very familiar with the basic origins of a certain society in order to deal with it when it comes to politics, economy. So based on what, what you just described, and um, and I think that your analysis of, of Saudi Arabia is is, um, uh, is proven right almost every day, right? We see what's happening. So how, how, what's your take on the most recent move vis-a-vis -vis Iran? and the sophisticated game that it seems that Saudi Arabia is playing with Israel? Well, I, I think that this game is, is different because, you know, people do have in mind the Abraham Accords. And we have there something which was really, really uh, big and very, very meaningful in Middle Eastern history or modern days, Morocco, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain. but. I have to say that Saudi Arabia is a different case study. So if you would like actually to just understand the way Saudi Arabia is normalizing, if, if and when, relations with Israel and to just put it in kind of in comparison to, let's say, United Arab Emirates, I have to tell you that this is a different opera. And we have to take into the account some other dimensions. First of all, Saudi Arabia is a state which these days is very, very uh, anxious about its future survival because of two things. United States, which was the ultimate protector of Saudi Arabia in the 20th century, is uh, signaling that the Middle East is not anymore a kind of uh, high priority in its strategy. The Saudis uh, do remember what happened in 2019 when Iranian militias from Yemen actually were attacking Saudi oil fields and that was to go unnoticed by the U.S., which was actually kind of a litmus test by which to say that the U.S. is not going actually to protect Saudi Arabia as was the case before. And as a result of its consternation, what the Saudis actually uh, 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 came to think that they must have kind of an alternative uh, in the shape of what uh, is called actually the Saudi-Iranian agreement, where China is the main broker there, in order to minimize actually the scope of danger. This is how I think that. Iran is the nemesis of Saudi Arabia. It hasn't started actually in the recent years. Uh, this is a process of hundreds of years. And uh, it has to do with Arabs versus Persians. It has to do with the Persian Gulf or Arab Gulf. It has to do with uh, Sunnah versus Shia. It has to do with so many things, hegemony in the region. So if you ask me what the motivation of Saudi Arabia is, 
is to find sort of a shelter or protection against a nuclear Iran in a newly created Middle East in that sense. So they would like the, the U.S. to get back, uh, uh, offer sort of a backup, uh, provide Saudi Arabia with an approval or a go-ahead sign for what they call civilian nuclear capacity. This what makes the Saudis move. Iran is in the back of mind. They highly afraid of Iranian expansionism, bid for hegemony, and they would say that the Iranians are not to be trusted. This is sort of a folklore. It's not at all um, scientific observ observation. But you know, when you are there, when you talk to Arabs, when you try to understand what this whole saga in the Arab Gulf is, you find, uh, uh, in, in, I mean, uh, between the lines, you find actually that, I would say, um, fear that comes from times memorial, from the Persians, from the Shiites, etc. Now, the other player here is the United States. And the United States is facing kind of an electoral year. And what they actually managed to do is to come to understandings with Iran on the one hand, but they have to appease Saudi Arabia. So uh, they do talk to Saudi Arabia, but when they are trying to come up with something that would benefit them electorally in the States, I don't know if that would happen, but kind of a lull in the Middle East, so to speak, that is uh, to be crowned by a would-be Saudi-Israeli normalization. For Israel, this is a big thing, I have to tell you, because Saudi Arabia is not another Arab state. If Saudi Arabia is going actually to be in, it would really, really uh, result in the opening of a very heavy and big door. Saudi Arabia is the leader in the Arab uh, uh, world nowadays. It has become very dominant. And of course, the banner of Islam, Mecca and Medina, this is not a state that would do a bilateral so to speak, agreement with Israel. They would like Israel to do something for that. And with the hope that other Arab and Muslim states would follow suit. So for Israel, this is a game changer. And in my opinion, Israel should do whatever it can to make this whole deal actually be successful, even if each one of the triangle, Saudi Arabia, uh, Israel, and the United States has its own reasons. But this is kind of a unique situation where all the three, each one of them for its own reasons, actually would like uh, a kind of a uh, successful completion of this whole deal. Now, it's clear that the Saudis will expect Israel to pay with the Palestinian currency. Okay, I agree with that. But don't forget that for them, the main thing is Iran. They would like Israel to pay with a Palestinian coin because of what I said, visibility, legitimacy from in and out. Once again, this is the leader of the Arab and Islamic world in a way. And they would like Israel to come up with something which is out of the box thinking. And here comes the stage where Israel should provide sort of a new, fresh creativity. Because if, if we do agree that this is in the best interest to have normalization with Saudi Arabia, because of what I said, Israel should come up with something that would make the Saudis and the Americans very, very satisfied with that. Israel cannot provide kind of a full solution to the Palestinian problem because it is a very, very complicated issue. But if you ask me, I can give you an example of what Israel can come up with, something that would be very, very attentive to Saudi ears. For example, Israel would be willing to have an Arab quorum or forum that from now on will accompany its dealing with the Palestinians. So Arab states are going to become kind of a player which would have an impact on that. And Saudi Arabia actually would like, of course, to have something which is very, very important, is a say when it comes to that. Let me remind you that they send their own consul to uh, 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 Jerusalem in, 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 in the recent days. Let us remind ourselves that they demanded, uh, or they would demand Abu Mazen to get into Jenin 
and bring in the PA once again in order to prevent Hamas from getting into the West Bank. Why? Because Hamas for them, for the Saudis and Emiratis, is a pariah. They were outlawed, actually, Muslim brothers, both in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. So, basically, you have here a state, and nobody actually is uh, becoming a Zion lover. That's what I said. Each one of them is very, very well, keenly, keenly aware of its own interests. Israel is not kind of an existential enemy for Saudi Arabia. This is the most important thing. And this is what we should emphasize. Now, let That's me ask you thing. about the concept of timing and time in general in, in the Middle East and, and the Saudis. Uh, let's assume, and I think it would be a safe assumption to make, that this current coalition in Israel is unable to produce the kind of creativity that you're alluding to. It's not going to happen with this coalition. Um, is there a danger of a window closing here? Or we're looking at different timetable here? In a way, yes. But I think that, uh, you know, if Saudi Arabia would do those steps, and I tell you, Saudi Arabia is interested in a shelter or backup against the Iranians, but they cannot conclude the deal without having kind of a gesture for Israel when it comes to the Palestinians. This is why I said fresh creativity, out-of-the-box thinking coming from Israel. If that is the situation, that's a disaster because this would close a window which is very, very important for Israel's future. And I dare say that in that kind of a thing, reshuffling the cards in the political system in Israel should be considered. Because if you cannot actually come up with something that would make the Saudis actually be on board in this normalization. And you don't understand that this is so, um, I would say, instrumental for Israel's future. You are going to miss an opportunity uh, that is uh, sort of a golden one in my, in my uh, take. I mean, this is my take, of course. And I think that uh, if that would come to what you just suggested, Yes, reshuffling the cards when it comes to Israel's political system would be should be considered at uh, this situation. Now we can we can talk about this for hours, but uh, but time is running up, and I just wanted to have some some a few minutes to discuss uh, the center itself. If you can tell uh, our our listeners and our viewers are all friends of the university, and they are eager to hear from you about the center, about the Dayan Center, um, its main uh, focus and plans for the future? Well, I think that the Dayan Center is unique. Two things I would mention here. First of all, it's the uh, the first research center for Middle Eastern Studies in Israel. We are almost 60 years old. Here, actually, I, I, I say that some of the main uh, figures regarding Middle Eastern Studies actually grew up and were becoming mentors of all of us. Professor Itamar Rabinovich, Professor Shimon Shamir, and others. And what we have always emphasized is, if you would like to talk about Iran, if you would like to talk about the Arab world, make sure that you are familiar with the language, with the culture, with the history, and with the way people memorize themselves. It is one thing to talk about Iran and the Arab world and the Kurds and the Turks without having a clue about their history and language. And it is definitely a different opera when you are familiar with that. Culture is so important, especially in the Middle East. History is not kind of a book on the shelf in the Middle East. It's sort of an idiom which is alive and kicking. If you come to just get an idea about that, if you can imagine the way the other side actually is fostering his future, you are much more penetrating than any other discipline that is being put to the test while trying to analyze the Middle East. So for us, this is kind of a diktat for our students, whoever they are, and our listeners, 
we should not deal only with geopolitics as is. Yes, I do respect, you know, nukes, uh, uh, missiles, and all that stuff uh, when it comes to the uh, military history or military reality. I do expect economy. I mean, I do respect economy and all that stuff with, you know, renewable energies. We haven't mentioned that, but Israel is very, very well advanced in that issue. And this has become something that, this is becoming something that is very instrumental for those states. But I would say that, first of all, you have to be familiar with the nitty gritty details when it comes to culture, history, and basically the narrative those cultures or those societies do hold. When you have this whole picture, you have, in my opinion, sort of a penetrating capacity in the sense of understanding the other, but using his own standards for doing that, not my or your standard. And this is the whole Torah on just one leg. Well, thank you so much for teaching us this very important lesson about the importance of... Um of ethos, really, in our region. And this is the story that uh, groups and tribes and societies and cultures tell themselves about themselves. This is really the meaning. And so, um, I mean, I could talk to you for hours, as I said before, and and I'd like to invite you again, because this, uh, this should be a periodical conversation because things change so quickly in the Middle East. Always with pleasure. And, uh, and I wanted really to thank you for that. Thank it was you. fascinating analysis, and I hope that Israel's decision makers are listening to you, Uzi Rabi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure, actually, to be here with you and just to share with you some of our insights and uh, a very fruitful discussion. Thank we'll you. We'll do it again soon. And to our listeners and viewers, goodbye from Tel Aviv until the next episode. This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomats. <laughs>